Hello, this is the Gemsbach, and today's topic is The Binding of Isaac Rebirth, a game developed by Edmund McMillan and Nicholas, and originally released in 2014. Since its original release as a subversive Flash game back in 2011, The Binding of Isaac has ascended from a cult classic to a mainstream success. In the time since that release, all of the elements which made it subversive, from its dark themes to its biblical allusions, have been covered and analyzed by critics from numerous angles. Theories about the meaning of the game's obscure, sparse narrative have ranged from wild ad hoc hypotheses about Isaac's family history to carefully built cases tracing themes across several earlier games made by designer Edmund McMillan. Regardless, it has seemingly all been said. I do see that sort of analysis as highly valuable, and I find myself largely in agreement with commenters who interpret The Binding of Isaac as a portrait of a particular type of upbringing, with all of the entailed positive, that is, creative and skeptical, and negative, that is, repressed and threatened, effects. Acknowledging that as trodden ground, however, I would like to discuss an aspect of the game which is often gestured toward but seldom discussed at length. How the roguelike gameplay lends itself to the game's homage and spiritual succession of the earliest Legend of Zelda games. The longest standing fans of The Legend of Zelda, those who have been playing since the first entry in the series, often find themselves in a strange love-hate relationship with some of the newer entries in the series. While a game like Skyward Sword looks and sounds satisfyingly like a Zelda game, it caters in every possible way to new, young players, from unending tutorial segments to an overbearing companion to minimal difficulty, entirely at the expense of experienced players. For such very long-term fans of the Legend of Zelda series, up until the release of Breath of the Wild in 2018, it seemed for decades that the core elements of the earliest titles, such as a sense of meaningful exploration, an emphasis on gameplay over story, and a significant level of difficulty, had been eschewed entirely in favor of linearity and accessibility. The openness and self-direction of playing The Legend of Zelda had been replaced by the interlocking puzzle dungeons and precise player guidance of A Link to the Past. Most of the 3D entries in the series play like variations on the Link to the Past formula, from Ocarina of Time, to The Wind Waker, to Skyward Sword. It's not a perfect split. Early Zelda dungeons interlock to some degree, and A Link to the Past has a few higher difficulty segments, but the change in emphasis from exploration and combat-focused gameplay to story and puzzle-focused gameplay is nonetheless stark and noticeable. None of this is to say that the pre-Breath of the Wild modern Zelda titles are all necessarily bad games. Far from it, many of them are excellent. Majora's Mask is a bold and interesting title, Twilight Princess has many memorable and wonderful segments, and I'm personally deeply fond of the characters, visual design, pacing, and gameplay mechanics of the Minish Cap. Zelda titles may have often included more tedium and less challenge than they should, but they have always been well-polished and enjoyable games. Rather than simply bashing the direction of the series from 1991 to 2017, this section's aim is just to say that fans of the aforementioned early core elements have typically had to look elsewhere to get their fix. A year after Skyward Sword released, and unbeknownst to him, five years before Breath of the Wild, game critic Tevis Thompson, after systematically criticizing the state of modern Legend of Zelda games as of 2012, alleged that Demon Souls came nearer to a presentation of the original Zelda formula in three dimensions than the series itself ever had. More recently, I should point out, he has had occasion to extend, with several caveats, significant praise to Breath of the Wild for the direction it's taking 3D Zelda. Meanwhile, back in two dimensions, in a similarly bold claim to Thompson's 2012 claim concerning Zelda and Demon Souls, I would argue that The Binding of Isaac is a worthy candidate for consideration as a modern spiritual successor to the original Legend of Zelda. The Binding of Isaac has always been a game with blatant references to, and inspirations from, the earliest Zelda games. Here's a quick list of some such elements. Isaac's animation when picking up an item is reminiscent of Link doing the same. 
The title of the younger game is deliberately structured to resemble the title of the older game. Many of the items, enemies, and hazards in Isaac are also specific allusions to Zelda items, enemies, and hazards. There is an obvious visual similarity between a so-called crawl space in Rebirth and an item room in The Legend of Zelda. Fans of Isaac who played its original incarnation will also recognize the bar at the top of the Zelda screen as being almost identical to the information display in Flash Isaac. And everything about moving through the world in Isaac, the cardinal direction only attacks, the scrolling room transitions, the locked rooms, the enemy and obstacle setups, etc., is also evident in any gameplay footage of The Legend of Zelda. But those overt references are not what makes the game a worthy descendant of Zelda. What makes the game a worthy descendant is the implementation of its gameplay and mechanics. How does one implement the sense of discovery and surprise from The Legend of Zelda in the modern world of instant access to game information? How does one force the player to learn the mechanics and gain skill, as opposed to having them memorize the sequence of tasks in the game? The principal answer to both questions was randomization, a key attribute of Isaac's other biggest influences, a 2008 game called Spelunky, which, like Isaac, has since had an acclaimed and excellent HD remake that is definitely worth playing, and a 1980 game called Rogue. By randomizing everything, from the items, to the consumable drops, to the enemies, to the rooms, to the bosses, to much more, Macmillan's design made it almost statistically impossible for two non-seated runs to be identical. Add to this elements like the predictable but not infallibly so secret rooms, the totally unpredictable crawl spaces, and the discernible but subtle tinted rocks. The result is a game that encourages literally leaving no stone unturned, and which rewards attentive play and situational awareness. Crucially, the result is also a game where the map may hold unspeakable challenges at inopportune times, or may provide an unexpected bounty when it is needed most. These are situations which make for a tense and interesting game to play, and these are the attributes of the exploration in The Legend of Zelda which made that game such a massive success in its day. Such forays into the unknown have only been aided by the addition of further floor variants, floors, room types, rooms, items, transformations, mechanics, enemies, and bosses which have been provided by the game's expansions over the years. But how do you simulate the stakes of a besieged world like the original Hyrule? How do you make it seem as inhospitable and threatening? Well, part of the answer to these questions comes from the aesthetic and thematic choices in the design of the game. A frightened child fleeing his homicidal mother through an arguably even more homicidal gauntlet of monstrosities, set to an undulating, ambient soundtrack with industrial samples, is a scenario most would call tense. But these aural assets are only how the game evokes tension. The way that the game instills tension in the player is, again, through its gameplay. With the help of the Nicholas team, and before that, Florian Himsel, Edmund McMillan made his game difficult, and he brought in permadeath. These attributes, again present in Spelunky and Rogue, round out the key elements of the conspicuously named roguelike genre so much in vogue at present. Aside from providing an obvious satisfaction at finally improving and defeating all of the challenges set before you, these attributes make each run, or at least runs without good early item drops, tangibly nerve-wracking when one's health pool runs low. The world threatens you with failure, and this is psychologically effective. This is why a successful run as The Lost feels so triumphant, because of the constant proximity to failure, and the balance tweaks to that character which have occurred in the intervening years have maintained this propensity for triumphant emotion while removing much tedium. Perhaps the single most important design decision, however, was the way that Isaac's attacking capabilities were handled. In the essay about Zelda mentioned earlier, Tevis Thompson laments at one point the gratuitousness of most Legend of Zelda titles' item bloat. That is, he thinks there are too many items that are redundant with each other, or which fail to affect Link's core moveset. When such a complaint can be valid about a game with fewer than 30 items at its most excessive, how can it possibly be the case that the literal hundreds of items in Rebirth do not introduce the same problems? The answer, once more, comes down to implementation. 
For all of its incredible variation, Isaac has essentially two offensive abilities, or three if you count bombs. He has his tears, and he acquires an active item. The genius of the huge number of items in The Binding of Isaac is that they meaningfully develop, alter, or build upon this core gameplay rather than adding new tools at every turn. Macmillan is no stranger to this game design philosophy, and his prior success, a game he made with Tommy Refinis called Super Meat Boy, employs an even more pure example wherein the core gameplay is completely unchanged from the start of the game to above 100% completion, with the exception of optional character unlocks. Isaac and Isaac's tiers grow stronger, or gain additional utility, or offer defensive capabilities, or change shape, but there are just a select few rare items that can actually change the tool that is being used. This is why Isaac players so prize the inclusion of interesting synergies between passive items. Rather than feeling like a Zelda series staple of checklist items allowing the completion of simple puzzle tasks, the items acquired in Isaac improve and upgrade the existing arsenal, which nevertheless relies on player skill for success. The point of this video is not to claim that The Binding of Isaac is by any means a perfect example of the early Zelda formula. After all, the epic scale of the Zelda games, communicated as much by their plot, however sparing, as by their overworld navigation, is not remotely communicated by the claustrophobic atmosphere of The Binding of Isaac, which operates more like a series of Zelda dungeons than a Zelda game in its entirety. It may incorporate early Zelda's thematic emphasis on exploration, but in Isaac, that exploration is always taking place within a sharply bounded and limited interior space, which is more in keeping with Isaac's tone. And speaking of that tone, the darker themes of the game, however crassly presented at times, make Isaac into something more cerebral than Zelda ever was. As I said before, long-term Zelda fans have had cause to rejoice in recent years, with the release of Breath of the Wild finally ending the lengthy string of iterations on the formula of re-reimagining Link to the Past in 3D, at last bringing some of the energy and design philosophies of the very first Legend of Zelda title into the third dimension. But as far as 2D games go, those same fans may still be left wanting. As for me, with one more expansion still hovering on the horizon, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth will doubtless provide me with many more hours of excitement, challenge, and curiosity, befitting of its regal forebears.